doing in Australia during the pandemic? Are things okay? Are they? Uh, no, it's a, it's sort of a mixed mixed bag at the moment because in some states, I'm I'm in Sydney, where um where the uh, um COVID cases are going up, um and um in other states like West Australia, for example, there are hardly any um uh, cases and. They want to kind of keep all the New South Wales people away from West Australia. So, and even within New South Wales, our premiers, um, she refused to sort of go, you know, too hard too early. And as a result of that, as um, you know, the the Delta variant has just sort of escaped, and um, they're always playing catch up. So, yeah, um, yeah, it's hard at the moment. There's lots of stories around it isn't there Ken you know there's um like there are facts and there are the stories and and you know when we talk about the importance of stories and and how they shape our identity our values and behaviors the pandemic in itself is a um, a construction and at the same time there are facts which can which cannot be disputed and there are facts which are interpreted in multi multifaceted ways aren't there Yes, that's a fabulous, um, that's a nice um, connection. Um, uh, and particularly the, um, you know, the, the sort of, it's a growing divide now between almost a narrative of the, the, the vaccinated versus the unvaccinated. Um, you know, the, the, the vaccinated story for me is one of um, protecting my health, but protecting my health of my family. Um, it's the right thing to do. It's good for the, you know, community. But I was, just talking to my brother and um, he lives in a regional town and um, he, you know, he's running into a lot of unvaccinated kind of story and it's the storytelling, you know, and it's just um, passed on, um, as you said, it's uh, almost slightly independent of the facts. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and so what is your take on stories and identity? And, you know, do you, like, obviously in terms of our identity, there are the biological facts that form our identity in terms of our our race, our gender, uh, where we were born. You know, those are things that we cannot change. Those are established facts. And then there's the part of the identity which is constructed and therefore can be deconstructed and and reshaped. For you, you know, being um, an academic as well. You know, there, there are stories that are um, uh, in the social sciences. The the stories that are based on people's interpretation of events. And then there's the natural sciences where they also have stories, but those stories tend to be more based on facts and logic and, and how things function um, regardless of how we try to shape them. Yes, um, that's a really good insight. Um, I mean, I, I, you know, I live in Australia and um, our indigenous people their history was based on story. It's based on storytelling. It's you know, it's it's not a written history. It's a storytelling history. Um, and I, I, I like I was um, just reflecting upon this when um, in my doctoral research, you know, 20 years ago, I was uh, talked to a lot of the managers, for example, from 3M, and they all had their kind of version of an Art Fry story. And Art Fry was a sort of, um, you know, discovered or invented, um, you know, post-it notes. And um, they'd always had this kind of stories uh, of the skunk works and going against the system and running up against people in the organisation that said, no, um, you, it couldn't be done. And so it was, their, their storytelling became a way of communicating um, values a way um, of kind of reinforcing um, behaviours um, uh, in, a, in a much more engaging, um, you know, way. And it was, it was very powerful. I was, it was kind of, I was struck by, you know, I could talk to six different managers and they'd all have their own version of the same kind of central story. Mm -hmm. Yes. And uh, you started off by talking about the Aboriginal stories and, and um, a lot of people well, we know we know this that um, their stories were disregarded; they were marginalised, and maybe some of that was because it was considered to be what they call mumbo jumbo. When yeah, we talk yeah. about mumbo jumbo, mumbo jumbo is like something which 
doesn't have legs to stand on <laughs> you know yeah. it's not based on logical facts and so so that on one side and then the management stories um when you go into a management meeting yes leaders and managers do tell stories but those stories need to have facts underpinning them don't they for them to be credible yes absolutely so um i think that that's a that's a case and and um and and in 3m case what 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 they reinforced that by was things like um you know uh having a a, a, a value which was all around innovation um and a goal for example that was that um you know sales of new products had to be 30 percent of their revenue um, from new product sales for example so the stories were kind of supported and complemented and this sort of symbiotic relationship between the stories and the metrics and the goals and um, um, and um, and and the strategy, if you like. So it was all it was, you know, to use a metaphor it was kind of left brain and right brain, you know, it, it was the sort of stories reinforcing culture and culture reinforcing the stories. Mm -hmm. um, and and when you put the two together. It's um it's very powerful. Um, otherwise, it just becomes like a kid's story, you know, which is can be uh, you know uh, easy to communicate, for example, and it's in, could be engaging, but it's 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 you know it's not based in anything anything real. Um, I was another example for me um, was uh, President Obama um, in two thousand and eight gave something they call it the race his race uh, speech. And he started by telling a story which which is grounded in, you know, he talked about his mixed race parents and and instantly it's 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 grounded in a, in a truth um, and and facts and so then he could tell the story because it was already grounded in something real. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Yes, and when you talk about management again, you know, like yeah leadership Obama and Trump, you know, they're both excellent storytellers. And yeah. I suppose that because they lead when leaders are very good at telling stories, they they connect easily with other yeah. people don't they? because other people can empathize with the stories they tell. And and then we I'm sure we've both uh, witnessed managers and leaders um, who have style and some who have substance, you know, and, and it's like style over substance. Some some people they're just very good talkers, but yeah. there is there's hardly uh, any substance to what they're saying, and that can be charming on one level, but other people get left to fill in those gaps of substance. Do you do, can you relate to that? Yes, absolutely. I've I've come across many um, many leaders that have. Um, uh, have, have, have been all, in a sense, kind of all style. It's a sort of charismatic leader, you know, in a sense, in dress and in tone and in um, appearance. And um, and yet, when you dig, kind of, you know, you sort of scratch underneath them, they just go, well, there's there's no substance. There's nothing, nothing quite there. Mm -hmm. um, and yet, the I think the the opposite is also true. I think you're right as well that. Um, the manager, for example, who uh, is is a substantive, for example, but with very little um, style, you know, I think also finds it difficult. Um, you know, we had a prime minister, um, uh, an Australian prime minister named John Howard, who was substantive in a, in a lot of ways, but but had no particular style. Um, but he sort of grew into the job. Um, and I think that's the other part of it, is that um, through his own, um, he, he, in a sense, which he was actually not a particularly good um, communicator, but he had a kind of his own story, which he brought, which was, you know, I'm like you, I'm a kind of middle class, I'm a, I'm a you know, a local um, solicitor, um, you know, almost a local accountant, and that's why I relate to you. So. He sort of connected in a sense made the most of his own story mm -hmm. yeah i suppose it's that's the thing about stories is like we can the stories can be um so uh, expansive that they can include everyone that we include in it whereas facts may not be so relevant to everyone whereas if you put those facts into a story 
um, people can see their own reflection somehow or other, because there's space for people in a story. Yes, I think that's very true. And I think then it, it, it's like, um, you're, you know, you're connecting head and heart, you know, um, and you're connecting kind of um, well, what exists with what's possible. You know, you know, there's, uh, there's, you know, with a future story. Um, um, one of the, um, when I, you know, give a workshop, for example, on a concept I developed called um, speed thinking, I always start every workshop with, um, with a story about my insight. And basically the story is um, very quickly that, um, uh, you know, have you ever been in a situation where, um, you know, you, you're working for an hour and um, not much has happened in a group or team. And, um, and then, you know, I used to pop my head in when I would work with leaders and say 10 minutes to go and there'd be this sudden huge burst of energy. Mm -hmm. And um, what, uh, and then amazing ideas often emerged. And, um, and what happens is then, and, um, is then when you tell the story, that was the story of my insight. And I also tell the story, it, it, there, there's a connection because there's sort of a truth to it because people go yes I've, I've done that I've experienced that and that's a really powerful way of kind of connecting and resonating uh, informing um, I think which is far more than if I just put up a powerpoint slide of you know three points for example <laughs> You know, when, when you said that you used to pop your head in and say 10 minutes to go, and then in that 10 minutes, there'd be that rush of energy and ideas would flow. It's that when, when you said they've only got 10 minutes, you've put a container around yeah. it, you know, and it's in placing that container, you've created that space for the ideas to emerge. Whereas without that container, it was like the ideas were just kind of, you know, blowing about all over the place, perhaps. No. Yes, no, no, that's a very good point. I think there's a lovely idea in um, uh, complexity theory, which talks about, you know, creativity lives at the edge of chaos. And, um, and I think that's this beautiful idea that you don't want too much order, because that squashes creativity. But paradoxically, when you give people too much randomness, <laughs> that, that actually, people don't know where to start. Um, no container, so, that's right. Yeah. yeah. No container. So again, like, you know, we've, we've touched on how it's not uh, this or that, it's this and, you know, yes. it's about both. We need both head and heart. We need both fact and fiction. We need both, you know, the, the space and the container. Yes, that's right. And, um, and you know, the, the, as you said, the, the sort of logic and reason with the, um, you know, the emotion and the passion and the energy, um, and the other aspect I, I think it, about stories, which I really like, is the sort of kind of linear and non-linear, you know, because the story can, can go, you know, forwards, it can leap back, it can leap ahead, it can, um, you know, it's filled with characters, it's, um, uh, you know, it's, um, and, and it can be highly evocative. With, and, and, and I think the pathway to our imagination is, is through the emotion. Um, and so uh, that's why, it was, you know, storytelling is, is, is really, really important. And the linear structure of a story, that's very much of a, you know, some cultures believe in a very linear structure and other cultures, for example, the Aboriginal, the Native American, a lot of indigenous cultures, they don't have that linear structure, you know, not such a rigid linear structure. It's more circular. It's more timeless it's more kind of eternal, it's more, you know, that, that it doesn't have, a story doesn't need to begin with a beginning and end with an ending, it can, it can be random. You know, the, I think sometimes that's where the, the conflict arises. It's like, well, is that story really uh, valid? Because it doesn't have a beginning and an end. So yeah. is it really a story, you know? <laughs> no, no, I, I, that's, that's, there's some really great insights. I, um, we were up in um, Northern Territory, but pre-COVID, it seems like another world away. Um, earlier this year, we were going for a trek, and the first day, we um, there was an Indigenous elder um, lady who sat us all down, and she started telling a story about the um, the spirits and the dream time of this um, gorge that we were about to walk into, and um, it was transforming. You know, it, we were kind of going because it was the very first day, first 
hour, and we'd gone from busy, you know, harassed city life, and suddenly we were all sitting down, there was a smoking kind of ceremony, and she was telling a story, and, um, and suddenly the gorge in my mind kind of came alive, you know, it was, so there was, there was something about, um, we, uh, stories which I love, which allows us to escape just the physical, you know, and, and get into, you know, kind of uh, spiritual sometimes for some people, but, um, you know, a, a bigger sense of what's possible, a bigger sense of ourselves, um, which I think is really powerful. Yes, because then you entered another worldview, you know, like you you left your city worldview and you entered the Aboriginal worldview. And and it's like in entering that other space, you everything looked, felt different. And and there is that kind of connectedness. You were aware of the connection between the gorge and yourself. And that's why it came alive. You know, it's like sometimes you can see even rocks breathing because we become sensitive to the, you know, because with quantum physics, we know that everything is moving. Even, yes. even in a rock that seems sedimentary, it's still, the, the particles in that rock are still moving. And it's like, and when you can tune in with that vibration, then everything seems to be alive, even though it's inanimate. Yes, that's lovely. And, um, and the other thing I would add was, um, it, uh, suddenly she was drawing connections between you know the, the the animals and and the and the land and the dirt and the um and the smoke and conversations and connections amongst us us as a group and um whereas we often were you know tend to like think more in isolation she was thinking in a more organic kind of connected way um which i which is just you know when with and as you said it's just a different lens i was um I was reminded of that um, just the other day. My um, youngest daughter is just finishing off um, uh, her law degree, and um, uh, and we were discussing a situation. and And I said to her, "Look, stop thinking like a lawyer." And um, and of course, she thinks like a lawyer because she's actually been trained to think like a lawyer, and she's just about to finish. But I found I was kind of reflecting on my own language, and and and. Um, and then I said, well, why not? What if we think about the same situation from a, you know, an entrepreneur's point of view, or a, you know, a scientist's point of view, or a, you know, a, a, you know, a customer service leader point of view? And suddenly, the situation changed almost, you know, in a sense before our eyes, just by using different prisms and different lenses. Um, mm -hmm. So. Um, yeah. uh, so I, I, I think I helped her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Because we, in shifting our perspective, you know, shifting our positionality, everything looks different, doesn't it? Yes, when, yes. When you are wearing your father's hat, you see your daughter in a particular light. But when you say if she was working with you and you saw her as a colleague, you would, you know, you would... Um, I don't know, the, the relationship would change. That's why in family businesses, the dynamics are usually very different. They can be either very positive or very negative, depending on what the dynamics are in the familial relationship. No, that's a great point. And um, one of the things that she wants to do, for example, is move cities, um, you know, if, uh, assuming that uh, COVID restrictions um, are lifted at the end of, end of this year, early next year, because she feels sometimes trapped by her story. And that's another part of the story, uh, you know, the aspect of story that she said, well, people only see me in a certain way. And I want to meet new people that don't know me. And I, that we can create, you know, together a new story um, about, about her and about them and about us. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that, I think that's another powerful point as well. Yeah, a very, very powerful point. Because, you see, I come from a place in England called Stafford. Stafford is quite a small town. It's a historic town, but it's quite small, quite provincial. And what I've noticed is that people from my community who have studied at university, they rarely go back to Stafford. They wow. go away to study at university. I went to study in Manchester. From Manchester, I, I didn't go back to Stafford. I went from Manchester to London, you know, to a bigger city. And yes. Uh, I, I wrote a book about the community, you see, so that's how I know I interviewed, you know, a, a, around 100 members of the community. And then that's when I realized that 
who has ever come back from university to live in Stafford? And, and I suppose it's because being outside of Stafford, studying in a different city has reshaped their identity so that it no longer, it's like, it would be like fitting a square, a circle into a square peg to go back because your yes. identity has shifted in a different way. Yes. Have no, you I think that, yeah, that makes perfect sense. Yeah. Um, and I think that's what she's doing. And and she's also, because she's 22, is, um, and you made a very valid point that um, she's changing her story about um, my relationship with her. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's not... The, you know the, the young girl I'm looking after anymore she's saying no I'm a I'm, I'm an adult you know and I have um, my own relationships and I'm studying and I'm, I'm going to get a job and um, my own friends and things like that and she's crafting in the next stage the next chapter if you like of her story mm -hmm. yes yeah and have you noticed that in yourself as well like from you know uh, have you always lived in Sydney or did you live dif in different places and did they shape your identity in some way yeah, it's a, that's a good question. Um, one of my regrets is that um, I, my wife, I, I didn't work full time, um, and and I wanted to also play sport uh, in England actually, and I, I played a lot of cricket, and I had an opportunity, and um, and then someone, um, unfortunately for me, in a paradoxically you know way, was um, offered me a like a career job, and I took the career job. And it's one of the things I've always missed in my life that I didn't um, take an opportunity to um, to to play cricket in England and overseas and things like that. But um, we finally got back. My wife won a fellowship to study at Oxford for um, she's a journalist and um, at the Reuters Institute. And so we lived in uh, near Oxford for six months, which was was fascinating, and we loved it. Um, but I I think. Um, it's it's informed me because um, just in in my work, which is around creativity, helping people who don't normally think of themselves as creative, you know, using storytelling, using um, uh, you know a, a practical tool, a tool like um, helping them to look at a problem through different perspectives, for example. Um, is uh, it just suddenly opens up something in them where they go, oh, you know, a friend of mine was, um, we were playing golf and we were waiting for the next uh, party to um, clear the green so we could have a shot. And he said, oh, I really, he's a school teacher. I really would love you to come and, you know, give a talk at the school. And um, he said, but I can't because I'm not, you know, I don't have a creative bone in my body. And I said to him, okay, um, how would a clown look at golf? And he straight away went, oh, well, we could, um, that might be, we might um, color the green, you know, purple, or we might have big juggling balls, or let's play music, or we could wear funny clothes. And I said, what are you doing now? And he said, oh, actually, I think I'm being creative, aren't I? And he was almost, you know, nervous mm -hmm. laugh, but, he, but it was um, a wonderful moment of realization for him. So I think things like, um, you know, as, as a device to connect with people in a, in a way which opens them up in a, in a kind of non-rational way, um, uh, that, that kind of, it's again this paradox, but also has a bit of a logic to it, mm -hmm. you know, because he could see what I did and could see there was a logic to just we're looking at a problem um, through a different lens and that made kind of logical sense to him which allowed him to be creative, It's um, which was this lovely kind yeah. of irony. And maybe he always had that skill, you know, he, he uh, it's just that he was defining it in a different way. So for example, you know, we both work with managers and we know that there are managers who, uh, they might've got that job, even though they didn't, they wouldn't have thought they were a good manager, but somebody promoted them because they were doing their job well. and. And so, you know, people can say, I'm not really manager material. And it's like, well, what do you mean? It's just their, their definition of yeah. the word manager. They don't see themselves as manager, even though they are managing really well. You know, like you can have women who manage their homes, um, they manage their children, and yet they might not believe that they are managers simply because they don't, they're defining management, not as like, 
um, management of of a home and budget shopping, you know, making yeah. sure you live with, uh, within your means, etc. All of that is management, but they don't link that with something else. So, you know, what you're talking about with your friend, it's they they do the creativity, they do they have the creative skills. It's just that they haven't used that label. So I think identity is very much to do with our labeling of ourselves as well and what do the labels mean to us and what do the labels mean to others as well right yes very good point and you touched upon also the idea of, of just language you know because you know in my doctoral research i called it that um you know um uh you know when i would interview creative directors from advertising agencies for example and um i spoke to a lot of them they would say their biggest challenge was, and they, they would say they'd almost had to dress up an idea in kind of rational clothes for it to be taken seriously, you know? So, because they couldn't use the language of, in their mind of imagination, for example, or creativity or an insight, they'd have to say, you know, uh, cost benefit or efficiency or structure mm -hmm. or, or you know, whatever. Or call it innovation. <laughs> yes, yes, no, no. <laughs> That's that's a really good point. I was um, I was uh, working with uh, I ran a workshop last week with an organisation and um, they've got this um, innovation platform that they're very proud of and, um, and they said look um, and I said where does it start and they said well when you have an idea when someone has an idea um, then we can capture them and you know um, uh, share them which is all good and evaluate them maybe um, and I said but where do the ideas come from. They said, oh, we just assume someone has one. And I, and I was trying to make the point to them, but wouldn't it be better if we could create great ideas to start with? You know, um, why, why would you leave it just to a random accidental process? Why don't we become a bit more deliberate around it? Um, wouldn't that be a good thing to do? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And what do you think is still mysterious about what we, um, you know, this relationship between creativity and innovation, stories, facts, fiction, what, what for you is still something that needs to be explored further? Um, I think the, the sometimes the biggest mystery for me is why leaders don't tell stories all the time. Why, why aren't they better at storytelling? You know, it's, it, it, it's almost should be, um, you know, maybe there should be a subject, uh, maybe you teach it or something, but they, it's almost like leaders and managers should do a subject around storytelling, you know, like they would do something around, you know, how to read a balance sheet, finance or, um, you know, accounting or a marketing subject. Um, I think as powerful as leaders or even more powerful is, is, is the idea of kind of being a good storyteller, you know, what does that kind of look like, you know, why aren't we studying it? Why aren't we, we better understanding? Why aren't we bringing in people who are good storytellers? You know, film directors, you know, for example, um, around and, and talking to leaders about how do you, how do you craft a story? Um, and so the mystery for me, I think, is one of the mysteries is just this idea of um, if it's so powerful, which I think it is, why aren't we better at it? Why aren't we, why don't we practice it? You know, why, you know, why don't we encourage it? Why don't we talk about it? Why don't we even acknowledge it? You know, <laughs> um, I remember once in, again, just another quick thought in my doctoral research, someone, um, cause it was on, how do you make a, how do you develop an org, a creative organization? And one of the um, senior leaders I spoke to said, I've been trying to have this conversation with someone for, 10 years and he almost looked under the table to make sure no one was listening around creativity. It was like, you know, this hidden hidden force that he couldn't, he couldn't actually talk to anyone about. Now, I think that that's changing um, and there's a lot of um, energy and zeal around the startup community, for example, and, um, and, and, you know, the startup community, what I think, one thing they've grasped on, which is kind of, you can connect it to storytelling is, with stories, anything's possible. You know, you, a story can go in any direction and you can have a story about anything. And I think the startup community is, a, 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 you know, is adopted that with software, you can, anything's possible. The only restriction, restriction is, you know, our own imagination. Um, mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, so it's a, a bit of a long-winded way around. That's, mm -hmm. that's where I think the, um, the, the great mystery for me is. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, absolutely. And and for me, it's about this balance between style and substance, you know. So some yeah. managers, as we said earlier, some managers, they're great storytellers, but there's no substance in their stories. <laughs> yes, yes. Yes, in fact, the it's a really good point. You know, the I told the story about the speed thinking one. That the, people play back to me all the time. They go, yes. Yes, that's happened to me. Yeah, I've, I've. So it's, it's, it's kind of it tapped into a truth. You know, it, it wasn't just a story I made up that happened to one person or one group at one time. It felt like it, it tapped into something like a universal truth. And mm -hmm. they went, yes, I, I, I get that. And now tell me more. How does? Because then I'd say, well, what happens in those ten minutes when you know suddenly these ideas emerged that weren't visible 50, 50 for the first 50 minutes you know that sort of idea yeah you're right it's like stories they can connect us on those universal emotion emotions you know like the dopamine the oxytocin you know is what else is there serotonin you know is that a good hormone you know it's like when a story kind of evokes those um those hormonal emotional reactions then they can connect you know especially if they create empathy you know if stories evoke empathy they can they can form you know leaders who are able to empathize and evoke empathy for themselves they they tend to be become powerful and then at the values level as well if if a story can resonate in terms of our shared values they become powerful but there's a lot of mystery around the power of stories in terms of how do we choose which stories to tell and which stories not to tell? Yes, no, no, that's very good. Um, uh, and, and like, it was interesting to me, if I relate it back to the 3M example, is that they, they were all variations of the one central story. You know, if you like, there was this sort of Art Fry story and then there was kind of all this, if you like, a sub story, and they all had their own individual version of that story. So that uh, I think that's a really interesting um, uh, observation I made about 3M, which was just this. You know, I talked about it as storytelling, as you know, leader as storytelling, and it was culturally accepted and in fact promoted that um, this is this is what leaders do. You know, that this is. And, and in fact, I would interview some of the managers and they would say, look, that reminds, I've got to tell you a story. Mm. And, and, and then they'd be off. And they'd think, it was funny because they would think nothing of, if I talked to them for an hour, spending 10 or 15 minutes, if you like, just telling me this story. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I contrasted it with other um, leaders from other organizations who would rarely talk about a story. You know, it's it's like it's almost like you had to you had to kind of go and fish for it. You had to kind of dig it out. It was there somewhere. Yeah. Whereas they were they they would openly. So that's probably another mystery. Why is it in some organisations, they they it's accepted or part of the culture around storytelling, you know, um, uh, you know, and and probably the um, there's you know, Apple's a good example. Maybe there's a there's a hundred and one Steve Jobs stories. Mm -hmm. and variations of the Steve Jobs story um, that um, kind of holds that culturally holds the organization together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, excellent. Well, thank you very much, Ken. It's been such a pleasure speaking with you. And My I'll pleasure. I'll speak with you again very soon, Ken. Okay, okay. as always. Thank you very much, Jess. Take bye. care. Bye-bye.